if all customer facing or at least customer um, teams that have impact on the customer, if they don't deal with them directly, if yep. they're not working under a single strategy aligned to that journey, something's not as good at best case, something's not as good as it could be. Worst case, something is probably broken. All right, welcome back to Exploring Growth. Today, I have the opportunity to sit down with Paul Butterfield. He's a founder and CEO of Revenue Flywheel Group, and they help transform sales teams into customer-centric organizations. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hi, Lee. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, before we get into our discussion, because um, we're going to talk about buyer's journey and all the, all the things. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about Revenue Flywheel Group. Uh, tell us a little about your background and kind of the things mm -hmm. you're involved in right now. Revenue Flywheel Group actually has existed as a part-time thing uh, since about 2015. But I left my last corporate VP role in uh, spring of last year to take it full-time, and we did a rebrand and all of that. But what we do is an outgrowth of my over two decades in tech leading sales organizations, both channel and direct sales – and also building and leading uh, revenue enablement teams and strategies at three different companies on a global scale. And, and bringing together the things that I have learned in all of those capacities to help clients learn how to think differently, it's usually differently, um, and be truly focused on what's going on with the customer and serving them while still, in fact, when you do it right, revenue generally takes care of itself. Right. Uh, yep. So, but this is that. It's me just taking a couple of decades of experience, things I've learned, things I've learned not to do, trying to help other people figure it out. Yeah, that's great. And so when we were introduced immediately, what stood out to me was your focus on the buyer's journey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know uh, with Signal Media, my content marketing agency, we focus a lot on the buyer's journey. So, mm -hmm. you know, people come to us and want podcast or video content created. The first thing we talk about is, Okay, let's talk about what's happening from the very mm -hmm. beginning, you know, maybe an ad all the way through to, to customer success. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it's not fully mapped out. So we'll have to look at what is actually happening. But, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we start with the, with the, the, the customer journey, the buyer's journey, because that's how we're going to be able to build content to serve the parts where they may have gaps for yeah. higher engagement or conversion or whatever yeah. it may be. And so I thought that that stood out. And so I think for a lot of companies, what I see is this big disconnect between sales and marketing, team, marketing teams. Yeah. And I think it's, I know it is, I can confidently say it's because they haven't thought enough about the journey, right? Because if they right. look at the full journey, they're going to realize that it's all one big happy family. We all, we don't need to have these, this divide and conquer kind of mentality. Right. So right. I'm, I'm curious your perspective. I, well, hundred percent, everything you just said. The one of the terms that that I use um, and, and that you may have seen on the website is what I call customer journey enablement. And we may get into this a little more in, in the episode, but, you know, you got sales enablement, you got revenue enablement. I look at it as customer journey enablement because of what you said. If all customer facing or at least customer um, teams that have impact on the customer, if they don't deal with them directly, if yep. they're not working under a single strategy aligned to that journey, something's not as good at best case, something's not as good as it could be. Worst case, something is probably broken and or, right. you know, somewhere in between. That's right. So to me, that journey is everything that you're talking about um, because you, you know, the marketing is typically concerned with, but then what happens when an SDR or a BDR, which may be marketing or sales, when they get a hold of them, then what happens in the handoff to sales, right? Is there a sales methodology that's customer centric that's actually creating a differentiating experience for prospects? Mm -hmm. What happens after that? Is implementation coordinating with all of this? I hope so. What about customer success? So that's to me that that's the entire journey. It's that infinity loop that we've all seen lots of slides on in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Mm -hmm. But I, my work is really focused on that point where marketing is probably handing it off to sales all the way through renewal and customer success. So, yeah, yeah, right. I, I like, you know, I, I, we haven't seen that infinity loop for some time. It's kind of gone away, but I did like yeah. it for a yeah. little while. It's kind of, yeah. it's kind of, you know, cliche, but it does make sense because the mentality is there. It does. Like it, it, it needs to start, it, it sort of starts and ends with everyone, right? So, yeah, it, everyone should be on, you know, playing on the field. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, and I in like SaaS, that. it really is an infinity loop. If you break the loop, you lose revenue. So yes. I think that's why it spoke to me because I've been in SaaS for so long at this point. So, yeah, I, I uh, totally agree. Um, yeah. And so, um, where does the term sales enablement sort of where was that born and how does it how does it apply to all of this yeah that's a that's a great question I'll, I'll, we'll do the we'll do the uh the, the abridged version because there's a lot I know there first also but, you you're you're yeah. like you're like a big time in sales enablement so i mean i'm, I'm sort of like poking the beast yeah. here a little bit but yeah tell a little bit about first like your some of your mm -hmm. roles um you were mentioning your own you were part of a an organization. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, we were talking about the podcast. Oh, earlier. the Revenue Enabling Society. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I got into enablement completely by accident, relatively late in my career. I guess the last twelve years or so of my corporate career, and so I guess now I've been doing about almost fourteen years. And the the short story is, I was leading the mid market east, or excuse, yeah, mid market eastern North America sales team at a company called In Contact. We had a change of leadership. New EVP came in. And after you'd been there a couple months, I went in in my 101. It was in September of 12. I remember this. And I went in. It's the last month of the quarter. I'm expecting to talk about deals to go, commits, slides, all that stuff. And we probably did. But he, remember what I remember is he walked <laughs> to his whiteboard. He wrote the words sales enablement. And in the fall of 2012, I'd never heard that term. And I was not new to sales. Yeah. And he explained to me what that was. And he went on to explain that he'd watched how I was developing my AEs. And yeah. he sent me home with the challenge. Was I willing to take on a role that he would create for me and figure out how to do what I was doing for my own team for the entire rev org? Because there was no learning development, professional development of any kind in our company for any department. Mm -hmm. And I went home for the weekend and came back and rest is history. So that's how I got into <laughs> it. So I was doing a lot of research. And the fact is there wasn't much documented. It was a new industry. A new profession, maybe is a better word. Yeah. Uh, there were some people. Forrester was started to document it. Gartner, some others, but there wasn't a lot. A lot of it was figured out, and I was always very grateful for those many years, uh, you know, carrying a bag and leading teams mm -hmm. that I had pretty good insights. And 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 my other, you know, sales leaders in that organization is like, guys, we we can't complain anymore. Bill's given me, you know, budget, and and we're going to have training now. What do we need, right? Yeah. So we we figured it out. So we didn't get everything right, but. But we got a lot right, and I got better. I went to GE, and then I went to Vonage, and finally ended up in an ed tech firm called Instructure where I had to come in. I never inherited an enablement team. I had to build the mm -hmm. strategy, build the team, et cetera. And the same time I'm going through this, the profession was going through this. Yeah. So sales enablement, but, but, but with the growth of the profession, there was a lot of – so what I'm looking for a lot of different opinions on what sales enablement is. And some of it was very centric, focused on just the learning and development and onboarding, things like that. Then you had folks like me that grew up in sales. And to me, if somebody's sitting in a class, we better see an improvement in their performance some point down the road or we wasted their time. Yeah. Right? To me, enablement was a means to an end and nothing more. Mm -hmm. so, so these two philosophies grew up side by side. And at some point, I don't remember really when it was. I started talking about it as revenue enablement because I started to figure out that but just focusing on the sales team, we were missing out mm -hmm. on creating a better customer experience. Others were figuring it out as well. So you fast forward to about two years ago. More and more people are using the term revenue enablement. I was elected as board president of the Revenue Enablement Society, but it was called the Sales Enablement Society at the time and had always been. One of the things that the board and I did uh, in, in the fall of 23 was announce a name change at our convention to be more current with what the industry was actually seeing. Yeah, that's so cool. that's that's a short version. And and there's also been a lot of shakeup in the enablement community. As the SaaS company, as SaaS, the SaaS economy contracted, yeah. enablement was hit hard. And as difficult as that's been, the silver lining, and I hear this from a lot of folks I talk to, is that enablement teams that weren't focused on revenue outcomes now realize that's it, right? Those yeah. companies don't have dollars to throw at the newest cool team or thing. Yeah. And so you've got to show a return or correlate a return. You're not generating the revenue, but you've got to show some correlation. So what is sales enablement? I mean, I say sales enablement. Yeah. You're, you're going higher level yeah. revenue enablement. What is revenue it? Enablement. It's a combination of things, right? So the first thing people, a lot of people think of is training, right? What, yeah. what is it? And yes, training is part of it. All training is sales training is probably sales enablement. But mm -hmm. there's so much more. There's working with marketing. Enablement teams cannot stand alone. In an ideal situation, enablement 
product marketing or possibly marketing, depending on how they're organized, but specifically product marketing at a minimum and rev ops mm -hmm. are a three legged stool, none of which will succeed fully without the other. And so a big part of enablement is working with those other teams like a product marketing team and making sure that product marketing has that customer map, that customer journey map. Product mm -hmm. marketing is generating collateral and things, but is that lining up with the way that we're teaching the sellers to sell and prospect and all of that? Let's make sure we're supporting them, all of that. Mm -hmm. It's working with the folks at RevOps to make sure that we are measuring the impact that enablement is having. Um, and I mentioned earlier, it's working with enabling the training and onboarding and continuing the professional development of those customer success teams mm -hmm. that are so vital for those customers okay, to be successful. That was a, yeah. that was a horrible, terrible, that was an essay question from high school. Essay, yeah. right anyway, but, but you get my point because the minute you sign a contract, the renewal cycle has started. And if they don't have a great handoff and a great customer success experience, renewal gets becomes very difficult in one or two years or whenever it is. Yes. So, yes. so again, at a high level, to me, enablement, revenue enablement is all of those things. You've got onboarding, you've got ongoing professional development, but, but it's coordinating, being almost a hub with these other groups to make sure that things are, the sale, sellers are hearing one voice, a united voice in how we're going to market. There you so go. It's, it's sort of the connective thing. tissue for, for, for everything Ideally, wor yeah. working together. Yeah. yeah. When it's working what, well. What's so interesting about this um, timeline that you're talking about from 2012, you know, into the current day is at the same time in a parallel, you have the birth of inbound marketing mm -hmm. and you have inbound marketing is now, um, you know, at first it was sales enablement, right? And then mm -hmm. as time goes on with inbound and other forms of product marketing and those kind of things coming coming on, especially heavy in, in tech and SaaS, um, that's where I think it has to be looked at as revenue enablement, not just sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think, yeah, go ahead. And, and there's still not consolidation. You'll hear people call it sales enablement, revenue enablement. I've even heard go to market or GTM enablement. I yeah. don't totally buy into that. Yeah. I can see where they might be coming from. That's why I just came up with my own label, customer journey enablement, because I found when working with executives, my last company I worked for was part of the Toma Bravo portfolio. We were one of their portcos. And I was asked to come in and a couple of times and do a do an advisory session with their CRO operating group mm -hmm. for all the portcos. And what I found in doing that is this group of highly educated, highly successful people truly did not work, did not understand what enablement was. And part of why is because if you're not living in it day to day and you hear two or three different terms for it and you're seeing it executed in two or three different ways, right? that just confuses. It's just confusing for anyone. Yes. That's where I came up with the customer journey enablement because that anybody can get their head around, even if they have no background in enablement, yeah. revenue leaders and go-to-market leaders understand customer journey. So. Yeah, for sure. And it, you know what I've seen, you tell me from your perspective, this mm -hmm. is this is something that's very hot and heavy in the SaaS world primarily. Mm -hmm. Do you see this in the traditional B2B world at all? It's growing. Yes. Okay. The answer is yes. It's probably, depending on who I talk to, five to 10 years behind where it is mm -hmm. in the tech Which world. makes sense, yeah. But I have friends, I have a good friend who is the head of sales enablement for The Economist in London. Oh, okay. I mean, very traditional, right? A magazine. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. they call them as a newspaper. But, um, but I know folks that head up enablement or on enablement in American Express at some yeah. of the biggest banks in the country, at the post office. Mm -hmm. um, you get the idea. Uh, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember where is the one um, I'm thinking of Ford. She runs a huge enablement program at Ford Motor Company. So yeah. it's coming along and more traditional. I guess Ford is, is B2B or B2C, but, but more and more companies are starting to figure out the benefits. Yeah. Okay. So as we kind of now set our sights on the buyer's journey mm -hmm. and you know, you, you work with a lot of sales teams, salespeople, when, when you meet them and you find them in their current state, mm -hmm. um, how are they typically operating? Are, are they thinking about buyer's journey? Are they thinking about any of that? That's hard to say <laughs> because, because within a sales team of any size, some have figured it out and some haven't. You're always yeah. going to have some, some tr highly successful salespeople that either, either subconsciously or consciously have figured mm -hmm. some of this out on their own and they're, they're crushing it because of that. Sure. But typically, the typical seller um, and typical organization that I've worked with either as an internal resource or as a consulting resource, there's a couple things going on. Even if the 
sellers and the BDRs and SDRs are trying to think about the customer and the buyer journey, they haven't been provided with that information. There's not a cohesive plan to train them on it and reinforce it yeah. and give them materials that help them utilize it. And what that results in is they do not have the business acumen to hold a conversation with a prospect that's not 20 questions and or mm -hmm. a demo and or a pitch deck. Yep. And and those things may all have their place, do have their place somewhere in the process. But in sure. that first conversation, it is not the yeah. ideal customer experience. You need to go in and add value. Yeah. And that's a problem in most organizations. Now you can you can identify that and you can teach them all of that. It's all fixable. Yeah. But that's that's probably the biggest problem I see coming in. Yeah. It, you know, salespeople are very tactical and mm -hmm. very technical in, I don't know if I'd say technical, it's probably confusing yeah. to say it that way, but tactical. Most SEs would differ. <laughs> yeah, it's just that they're, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not technical. No. So that's not a bad, bad way to describe it, but they're yeah. tactical in that, like you described, yes. they, have, they have their set game plan right. and they don't know about where the buyer's coming from or where the buyer's going to. Right, And right. that's a big problem for context yeah. in how they're deploying their game plan. Right. And and you've got typically you're going to have multiple ICPs or buyer personas, whatever the company happens to call them. Mm -hmm. and, and and they've got to understand who they are. What do they care about? Right. What what are the things in their world that whatever product or service we're selling can impact? And why, what are the use cases and the problems that current customers that do the same, that are in the same job role yeah. are, are solving for and why are they buying? I mean, you bring all of that and you package it in a way that sellers can digest and make conversational. Prospects notice. Prospects, yes. we've heard this over and over and over again. They notice that kind of discovery meeting and they appreciate it. It's much more intentional, much more personalized. Mm -hmm. So let's get into it. And a lot stickier too. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot, probably, probably when it gets down to it, just because you're building so much more trust in mm -hmm. those, in those interactions. Um, and then your the trust that you build is being delivered on. Mm -hmm. um, so your, your, your framework, your, your, um, your thinking in terms of uh, the, the revenue, um, what, what did you call it? The buyer's journey enablement? I call um, it customer journey enablement. Okay. So yeah. let's talk about that framework. What does that look like and how is it different? I mean, we know probably we don't need to talk about how it's different because we know it's pretty right. very different right. than right. what current salespeople are doing. But how are you getting salespeople to shift to this new mentality? Well, when I talk about customer journey enablement, that's more than just the sales teams as we talked about. Yeah. But, but to answer your question, any major change like we're talking about here, whether it's in how they're prospecting, how they're doing discovery, how they're mm -hmm. negotiating, anything, has to come with executive sponsorship. Whether yes. you've got a chief sales officer, a CRO, an EVP of sales, whoever that highest sales leader is, this needs to be something that they see the need for and that is then going down through the frontline sales leaders. Because one of the things I learned very quickly when I moved into enablement is nobody in sales reported to me anymore, and they didn't have to do anything that I suggested. Yeah. And uh, so, so making sure that we've got, that we're working with the sales leadership team, frontline sure. through executives, is critical to driving yeah. any of, of these changes. Of it's just course, that simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it makes yeah, it's, the best it's enabler in the world will do nothing if sales yeah, leaders tell if they have to listen to ignore it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it, uh, it's it's got to come back to a business outcome that's driven from yeah. leadership. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. So 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 how how are you? Let let's describe your customer journey mm -hmm. enablement uh, framework. Mm -hmm. um, take us in through. Take us into that and tell us kind of how that works. We've covered a lot of it with some of your other questions. Uh, because again, the way I look at it is you talked to the beginning of the, our conversation about companies needing to have mapped out that customer journey or mm -hmm. buyer journey, right? So let's assume they've done that. Mm -hmm. Then what we're doing, and, and it's those teams, it's marketing, it's rev ops, it's enablement, looking at that and sales leadership at some point uh, as well, but looking at that and figuring out what those touch points are, mm -hmm. figuring out what could we be doing better, right? Because we've already talked about a different kind of discovery, a different yep. kind of prospecting, a different kind of, right? Um, how do, we, and, then, and then how are we going to plug those gaps? You can't do everything all at once, but you can get a lot done when you're doing it coordinated across multiple teams. So 
I, I don't have a standard framework, Lee, mm -hmm. just from the standpoint that although there are many commonalities when I come into an organization, there are still sure. enough differences mm -hmm. that a deep assessment is is always what I recommend before we in start building anything. Right. Let's go in and let's, so that's the, usually the first step I will do. I, you know, they'll give me access to Gong or Chorus. They'll give me access to Salesforce, sure, yeah. give me access okay. to, you know, and I will interview so very folks and I'll, yeah. And then I'll come back to the executive team with a recommendation, say, you know, here, here's a SWOT analysis, mm -hmm. kind of a funnel, right? Here's a SWOT yeah. analysis, high level. Here are the, here's your biggest thing I see impacting revenue. Here are the next three things. Here's yeah. what you can do about it. Right? And, and, and I, and my idea is that if I've done a great job, hopefully they'll keep me around and pay me to help them execute all this. Mm -hmm. But I also promise my clients to give them a standalone uh, analysis that they can take and execute on their own. Maybe they can. execute. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, so, so that's part of the framework too, is, is honestly figuring out what's going on within those revenue and go to market teams that's causing the problems that we're seeing. So, so when you're, you're looking at all these organizations, Mm -hmm. What and you see patterns and everything. Mm -hmm. What's something that sales and marketing teams could do right now to uh, sort of adopt this methodology, this this idea? Um, if if you don't have or if they don't have a well defined ICP buyer persona, and by that I'm talking a profile, fully developed profile, mm -hmm. background on you know what they do, what a day in the life looks like, mm -hmm. again problems that they are current customers in that role are solving with what you sell, what the mm -hmm. company sells. Uh, you get the if you don't have that well defined, and worked with enablement or worked with somebody to give it to the salespeople in a digestible way. So that is battle cards, maybe, but it's yeah. also are your outbound scripts and anything you're writing for them speak that way. Does your website speak that way so that the salespeople are being set up for that kind of conversation? Yep. That's where it begins. If you don't have those buyers figured out and your salespeople trained on how to talk to them at a business level, Yeah. anything else that I'm going to talk about isn't going to work. Yeah. Uh, so then let's flip it on its head. What mm -hmm. What is at least something they should stop doing? <laughs> <laughs> stop defaulting to a demo on the very first call. Yes. And, and, and to be fair and SaaS, we've done it to ourselves. Now customers expect it. Yeah. But I've also, it's rare to run into a customer who when you explain, again, you're not going to play 20 questions with them, but you explain the, the purpose of the conversation and they can see that it's actually a conversation with some intelligence behind it. Sure. Um, most of, if they're a serious buyer, most of them will appreciate that. Even if they say, well, I was expecting a demo. This is where I talk about, we got to make sure we're all working together. Mm -hmm. When marketing has got the SDRs and BDRs report to marketing a lot of times. So what is the, what are those BDRs setting for expectations when they create the appointment? Are they setting mm -hmm. up for a demo or are they setting an expectation that this will be a conversation about your business? Everybody's got to be setting the sales team up to do that. But that's the biggest thing is stop default because without knowing what that prospect is dealing with and what mm -hmm. they're looking for, you're just throwing a lot of you know what at the wall yeah. and watching to see what sticks, if we're honest. Yeah. That's, all, that's all a demo is yeah. without intelligence first. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Um, if so, you know, maybe to round this out, talking mm -hmm. about six, you know, measuring success or, or even reporting, it seems mm -hmm. like there would be a mechanism, you, you know, I guess the gut, from my own, from my own knowledge, I'm interested to know mm -hmm. um, about sales enablement um, mm -hmm. in terms of how you're communicating what, how value that's bringing, right? You mentioned yeah. how to, you know, you're measuring certain things and you're being able to mm -hmm. report. What does that look like? It's gotten a lot easier to do because of technology that's come on the scene in the last couple of years by, by correlating and to emphasize only sellers generate revenue. Enablement teams do not, marketing teams do not generate actual revenue, but they both need to be able to show correlation, reasonable, yes. consistent correlation to that revenue increase. And when I started trying to figure out how to do that before the technology existed, uh, a mentor of mine, guy who's uh, led four, three or four successful exits, so he knows a thing or two, right. uh, recommended a book to me called The Strategy Focused Organization. It's Harvard Business Press, Kaplan and Norton are the authors. And it's a little dated, but the concepts are not. And and the and what Kaplan and Norton tried to solve with this myth, and it does read like a textbook because they're professors, but yeah, what right. they were trying to solve for was a dilemma I imagine that you've seen multiple times. I definitely have. Companies roll out a grand strategy, 
And six months later, nobody could tell you what it was, much less any measurable results. That's what they were trying to solve for. Mm. And they do that by creating a strategy that starts with revenue outcomes. And every element of the strategy is building and connecting back to that. I mean, I'm super simplifying this, but... Sure. Um, and also there's a balanced scorecard for every element of that strategy. You are setting a goal, a measurable metric of improvement for every element of the strategy it might be monthly. I have found quarterly is about the right cadence to you know change those. And you're measuring the success of that. And if you've built the map correctly and you're, and you're making those measurable improvements in every map of this element of the strategy map, the revenue will take care of itself. So yeah. that's how we did do it. Now, again, there are some great software out there for enablement teams to use now that also ties into Salesforce or Dynamics. Yeah. And you can track things that the sellers and the customer service team are doing, success team are doing, and measure it back to those Salesforce revenue numbers. Yeah. That's made it a lot easier. So for me, it's probably a blend of both of those right now. Because if you don't start with the strategy map, you still don't know what you're going to measure in the technology piece. So. Yep, that's right. That's right. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, there's thanks a lot me. packed in here. And mm -hmm. so anybody that's tuning into Sales Enable for the, for the first time, just hit mm -hmm. repeat and listen to this again, because mm -hmm. we've just covered a lot of ground. And I think there's a lot of rabbit trails that you can take off of this conversation. Oh, we could uh, do a few episodes. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if I want to send people your way, where do I send them? Uh, they can go to the website, book an appointment with me directly through the website, or I am... I'm well, easy to find on LinkedIn, fairly pretty active on LinkedIn and always happy to hear from people that way as well. That's awesome. Thanks again, Paul. And we'll have to have you back. All right. Thanks, Lee.